it's now my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor John Matic AO. Um, now, John actually did ask me not to read out his biography, but um, Pauline John, Pauline DeWeird told me that he's way too humble. That's crap. Read it out because it's worth <laughs> celebrating. And as you know, if Pauline, if Pauline instructs, we follow. Um, plus, it is truly, um, anyway, uh, a, John is a, um, a humble person, but he's a man within our uh, Mary Aiken Head Ministries family who should be celebrated. So I am going to read out his biography, um, despite his protestations. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, no, it's, it is the abbreviated version because, believe me, folks, it is quite long. Um, John um, completed his undergraduate and postgraduate studies at the University of Sydney and at Monash University. Um, in 1977, he undertook postdoctoral training at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, in Texas, um, and he returned to Australia in 1982, where he then joined the CSIRO Division of Molecular Biology in Sydney. In 1988, John moved to the University of Queensland in Brisbane, where he was the Foundation Professor of Molecular Biology and Foundation, Foundation Director, ARC Federation Fellow, and then the NHMRC Australia Fellow at the Institute for Molecular Bioscience. During this period, he was also the Foundation Director of the Australian Genome Research Facility, the ARC Special Research Centre for Molecular and Cellular Biology, and the ARC Special Research Centre for Functional and Applied Genomics. In 2012, he returned to Sydney to take up the position of the Executive Director of the Garvin Institute Medical Research, where John still is today. Uh, for those in the Education Ministry who may not be aware, um, the Garvin Institute of Medical Research is one of the co-located large research institutes on our Darlinghurst campus and works closely um, with St Vincent's Hospital Sydney as, as well as other hospitals and also um, is a partner with St Vincent's Hospital Sydney in our Kinghorn Cancer Centre. Um, John has served on councils, advisory boards, way too numerous, and committees, way too numerous to mention, uh, a number of research and fun, found funding organisations, including Genome Canada, the Wellcome Trust, the Human Frontier Science Program, the National Health and Medical Research Council, and the Human Genome Organisation. He has made several seminal contributions to molecular biology over the past 20 years, and he's pioneered a new view of the genetic programming of humans and other complex organisms. John has published over 250 research articles and his work has received coverage in, in many lauded magazines including Scientific Ameri American, New Scientist and also in the New York Times. Some of his um, many, many awards include in 2012 the Hugo Chen Award for Distinguished Achievement in Genetic and Genomic Research, 2011 the International Union of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology Medal, uh, Fellowship of the Australian Academy of Science, and in 2006, the CSIRO Eureka Prize for Leadership in Science, 2003, the Australian Government Centenary Medal, and in 2001, he was made an officer in the Order of Australia. John is going to talk to us today on the transformation of healthcare. So could you please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor John Maddock, AO. Thank you, Rob. I thought it was going to be the short version. <laughs> um, and you left out the... Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, good morning everybody. Um, you left out the most important part. Um, uh, my formative years were spent at St Mary's Concord under the tutelage of Sister Mary St Gregory, many of whom remember her. I remember her for whacking me on the bottom. And, the <laughs> <laughs> and then I went off to St Pat's uh, Strathfield and I uh, was still uh, very friendly with the, the, the teachers that taught me 50 years ago, uh, including having lunch regularly with Peter Hancock, a Christian brother, and uh, lunch two weeks ago in Toowoomba with Rod Spearing, who was my science teacher and was really why I became a scientist. Um, he could put uh, sodium into water, nothing would happen, but he was... <laughs> well, there's Peter there. <laughs> I'm not going to tell stories about you, Peter. <laughs> Um, but it's just great to have uh, I've had that experience and education from the, the Sisters of Charity and the Christian Brothers. So it's nice to be back in the family. I want to thank Helen Clark for organising me to come and speak. I got an edict, so I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, uh, I'm really pleased to be here. So I came back to Sydney. Uh, I was uh, many years happily in Brisbane uh, at the University of Queensland. And I came back to Sydney because I saw an opportunity at the Garvin Institute to change the future of medicine and healthcare. 
and an opportunity that I didn't think my contemporaries were really appreciating because the traditional paradigm of biomedical research, which has been my life, uh, is quite reductionist. You know, I tell my colleagues that they tell everyone they're studying New York City and their New York City might be Parkinson's disease or prostate cancer or whatever. But they're actually studying traffic lights and uh, thinking that they'll be able to put Humpty Dumpty back together again by, by doing that. And it's important to have a level of detail. But uh, I saw a transformation coming. I'll take you through a bit of a journey in the next 30 minutes, uh, which I hope will impress upon you, at least superficially, uh, the claim that uh, understanding our genetic heritage and our genetic idiosyncrasies and figuring that in and not only into the traditional medicine of crisis management into, but into the new medicine of health management uh, is the way it's going to go. And I'm, I'm thrilled that St Vincent's Australia has uh, put precision medicine uh, as one of its four key priorities for, for the near future because this is about tuning medicine and healthcare to you as individuals. And so uh, uh, hold on to your hats because this will be a fairly brief presentation, but I, I want to come bring you out the other side and have you think about the way in which the ministry of the Mary Aikenhead Ministries is going to evolve and I think will be the leader, uh, frankly, in this transition of medicine from the art of crisis management pitched at the average to the science of good health uh, focused on the individual, and, but, but uh, using that information to stratify healthcare resources and make sure that our healthcare system is much more informed, much more efficient and much more effective. So I'm just going to take you briefly through uh, what we mean by genomics, uh, its power and, and the future, as I said. You probably know this, but just as a primer, uh, uh, although you may be surprised to know that in every cell in our body, and there's roughly 100 on a pinhead, your size, we have over two metres of DNA. Two metres. And uh, it's wrapped up into this, uh, it's the classic, uh, when it's stretched out, it's a double helix, which you can, you know, it's the icon of the age. It's like a twisted railway track, where the rails are the backbone and the sleepers are the information. And then it's packed up in with round proteins called histones and then packed up and packed up like cotton around a spool so that we can fit two metres of this information in each cell. Now this is the what we inherit from our ancestors. I don't think it's the only thing we inherit from our ancestors. And if you want to ask me about transgenerational non-genetic inheritance, I'd be happy to talk about that. But there's really interesting evidence coming through that um, previous experience, going back generations, uh, including cognitive experience, can have an impact on people's uh, uh, phenotype, as we say. Anyway, so there's there's a lot of DNA in our cells and. It's two copies of, of, of uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes, one, one copy we get from mum and one copy we get from dad. And by the way, in the formation of sperm and ova prior to conception, their parental chromosomes from their mum and dad get scrambled and sort of mixed up. Uh, I don't mean mixed up badly, but so that we're not, in, we're not inheriting a clean chromosome from grandpa or grandma. We're actually getting a mixture of grandma and grandpa's chromosomes from mum. So, uh, there's 23 pairs. Uh, down the bottom right, you'll see this is a female because, as you know, uh, women have two X's. Uh, we men are deficient. We only have one of them and, and a little thing called a Y, uh, which causes all sorts of problems and for many reasons. I mean, by the way, be pleased to know, uh, sisters, that most of the genes involved in human intelligence, or many of them, are on the X chromosome. So <laughs> just confirming biologically what you knew already. <laughs> But the problem is we've only got one of them, so if we've got a damaged gene in the X chromosome, then we're much more likely to have a problem like colour blindness, which is X chromosome linked. So that's the set of chromosomes, but in fact, it's, um, it's uh, a lot of AGCTs. It's a quaternary code, not a binary code like in computers. For historical reasons, the four letters are called A, G, C, and T. And it's a combination and sequence of those letters that determines uh, what we are and who we are. Um, my scientific career, which uh, Rob mentioned briefly, I think, was uh, concerned with uh, proving that the 98% of our DNA which does not code for conventional proteins is not junk. Uh, and it was actually a rather ignorant view of the genome uh, from a mechanical age. So about 2% of our, our chromosome codes for conventional genes, our DNA codes for conventional genes. There's a gene for carrying oxygen, uh, making haemoglobin. There's a gene for signaling high sugar levels called insulin, etc. And these are the component parts. 
I don't want to drift too much off the narrative here, but it will shock you to know that we have 20,000, well, that's not shocking, but we have 20,000 conventional protein coding genes for this part set. So do worms in the soil. They're only one millimetre long and only have 1,000 cells. And what's even worse is most of those genes are the same. <coughs> so what makes us human is in the other 98%, which is the instruction set for putting this part set together in different ways at uh, both species level and individual level. So we've got, uh, there's a thousand of these so-called bases or letters on this slide. Where your genome is six billion bases, so imagine it's got six million times the number of letters on this slide, half from mum and half from dad. And between us as individuals, there's about 0.1%, so one in a thousand bases will be different. One in a hundred bases is different between us and chimpanzees. But between us as individuals, uh, about uh, three million differences. And it's actually those differences that determine our uh, idiosyncrasies. So if you look at this photograph, this will get entertaining, I assure you, very quickly. We've done the hard bit. <laughs> um, uh, you look at these individuals, and these are identical twins, and, and you see the beautiful diversity of the human species. But also, um, when you look into their eyes, look at the chap on the top right there, you know, uh, they're identical twins, so they're a little bit different, but, uh, but they're essentially phenocopies, as we say, of each other. You look at the eyes, there's a similar personality shining out through their eyes, etc. And it, it's, it's true that all of our physical characteristics and many, or to a large extent, of our psychosocial characteristics are determined by our genetic inheritance. As my wife said when I went to see her after the birth of our second son at the Mater in Brisbane, this one's different, she said. <laughs> I said, how can you tell? She said, well, I just tell. Well, women know that, well, she does well, But he was. You know. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> Two X chromosomes, remember that. Um, but, but from day one, he was different. I think everybody knows that you know, our personalities are largely set. They can be changed by experience, particularly violent experience, but, uh, but uh, we are who we are. Now, I want you to look at these two chaps, and I'm going to blow them up. And uh, this is, sorry about the grainy black and white photograph, but this is a very interesting story here, uh, which proves, well, essentially proves the points. Now, the, these are two twins who uh, hardly ever met each other in their lives. They're identical twins. And it turns out in the 1950s and 60s when it was unfashionable for women to be unmarried mothers, that in your, those of us old enough recall that many of those children were adopted out. This included in the United States several hundred pairs of identical twins who then grew up separately. Times changed and they got back in touch with each other and uh, you know, made the connections, but they'd grown up in different social and cir physical circumstances, etc. Then there was a convention, which was the photograph was taken in Ohio, I think it was, or Minnesota, where the, many of these, hundreds of these twin pairs came together. And there's a BBC program, and this is just fascinating to watch, and you see two women walk in, you know, the tent, and one's got a pink cashmere sweater on, a bouffant hairdo, and then a sister walks in, dressed almost the same, the same sort of hairdo, not... And these two guys, just to illustrate the point. Now, look at, if you look at them carefully, <coughs> now one's a bit porkier than the other, <laughs> but look at the glasses. Now, these people have grown up separately, and they don't live with each other, and, you know, uh, the moustache, they've got the same moustache. The belt, belt buckle. Look at where the keys are on the right-hand side of their... <laughs> and the way that they're holding their beer cans with their pinky underneath. Yeah? So it turns out <coughs> that when these uh, individuals were, were studied, it turns out they're far more like each other than identical twins who grew up together, which is totally counterintuitive. Um, the interpretation is, if you, <coughs> excuse me, if you're looking in the mirror, then there's you know, a tendency to want to be an individual and it's pushback, which means that the use of twin studies, by the way, for those scientists in the room, is actually underestimated the genetic component of psychosocial characteristics because that's often based on twin studies. In any case, you see the beautiful diversity of human spirit here, and that's all you know, in the uh, differences in our DNA, most of which we don't understand yet. But, uh, you know, I sometimes used to say, I no longer except to recall, that the second half of the 20th century was the century of biology, with the, starting with the double helix as kind of like the iconic start point. That was in 53. And uh, I grew up during this uh, 
and you know we, we learned how to clone individual genes, the gene for insulin, the gene for growth hormone, and find out what it looked like and what it did. Uh, and we thought we were hot shots, you know. We had our pepepin on our belt, and we, we, you know, we were the young guns and Turks. But really, I was wrong. This uh, this 20th century was a century of physics and electronics, you know, going up into the computer age. This is the century of biology and medicine. I want to explain why. <coughs> 15, 16 years ago, in 2001. Uh, the first human genome was sequence was announced and it was published in, uh, there were two uh, consortia involved, uh, which are represented either side of um, President Clinton here when the announcement was made. It was front cover of Time magazine. By the way, uh, as a little social aside, there's backstories everywhere. The guy on the left, Craig Venter, was the bet noir of the project and he's a, uh, I think, um, uh, a rather uh, eccentric in the uh, pharmaceutical sense. Um, uh, ex-Vietnam vet, and the guy on the right who read the public project is uh, a Baptist minister who plays guitars at the drop of a hat. <coughs> so they got along like a house on fire, if you imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of rivalry. But anyway, on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, this President Clinton but Prime Minister Blair announced the sequencing of the human genome. It was the space project of the age, and it cost, I'll say this slowly, $3,000 million to do it. $3,000 million. And, you know, you can imagine this, this, was, this was a magnificent achievement. Imagine, you know, we get to a stage in our technological development where we can actually read our own genetic material. We might not understand it, but that was 16 years ago, 2001. Since then, um, the cost of producing genomes, human genomes, has plummeted. Now, this is a log graph, so factors of 10 on the, on the y-axis there. And the decrease in the cost uh, followed the classic Moore's law of computing until 2007. Now, the Moore's law says that the speed of computing will double every 18 months and the cost reciprocally will halve. So it's, a, it's an exponential curve. And then the technology changed um, and it dropped like a stone. This is the fastest revolution in, in technological history. So it's to the point where at, uh, in 2015, down in the bottom there, the price dropped to 1,000 from millions and millions to a thousand dollars, which many meant that it was ready for prime time, it was ready to use, to explore, and use in medicine. I want to show you how we're doing that. So I, I came to Garvin because I saw the opportunity, I saw this coming, not, not the thousand dollar genome, but I could just see the trend. And um, I thought, um, I probably shouldn't say this, but bugger it, I thought. <laughs> Nobody else is going to do it. We'll do it. We'll do it at the Garvin. And I've had tremendous support, both from the colleagues and the board and also from philanthropy, particularly the Kinghorn Foundation, has given us in excess of $50 million to do what I'm going to show you we're doing. In the beginning of 2014, we became uh, one of the first three sites in the world to acquire the system which would deliver a full human genome sequence for the, a base cost of $1,000 US. It actually costs around... 17 or 1800 Australian by the time you figure in exchange rates and some extra staff costs, etc. But it's, it's uh, now feasible to use at large scale. And we have actually just completed our 14,000th whole human genome. 14,000. And I might just um, say in passing, we can come back to this if you like, that uh, I'm pretty confident the federal government will announce in the next year or so uh, the sequencing of, in the first place of 1% of Australia. Uh, starting off with uh, uh, individuals and cohorts of high unmet need, maximum medical value, en route to sequencing the whole country. <coughs> so that human genome sequences will become standard part of medical records and figured into health management plans. And I'll give you examples of how that's going to work and some early wins. We're sequencing over 1,200 a month. We have a large team, not just of people doing the sequencing, but also software engineers. Uh, we've put, for those of you in the hospital sector, we've uh, developed software which will automatically convert EHRs into machine-readable text so that artificial intelligence can go to work on these records and look for the patterns. You know, all the people responded well to this drug, had this variation, etc. So we can start to understand natural variation. Everyone knows that that's very, very important. So I want to give you two case studies about the early wins and uh, in genetic diagnosis. Uh, one in 50 children born in this country and in every other country uh, have a severe physical or intellectual disability. It's 2% of all births. You know, in the old days, pre-ultrasound, um, uh, uh, 
I, I think people would wait nervously to see how the baby was and make sure that it wasn't disabled in some way. And you must be all familiar with stories of family tragedies that are, uh, where people have been afflicted with this. So here's one. This was actually an American pair of twins. So you can go online and see the parents' trust and testimonials. They're fraternal twins. <coughs> and uh, you know, I won't read it all in, but just quickly. They suffered seizures, coordination problems, vomiting, misdevelopmental milestones. Nobody gives us answers. They spiralled downward. Uh, by 11 o'clock, she couldn't walk, sit up or swallow food. Her hands would roll around. For part of the day, she couldn't function. So the mother, and this is a backstory here, for those of you who haven't read the book, um, The Patient Will See You Now, there's a book uh, by Eric Topol, a cardiologist from, from uh, San Diego, uh, who charts out the, his view of the history of the future of healthcare. And this has got to do with the social changes, the high tech change with personal devices, as well as genomics, etc. And one of the chapters is on the patient empowerment, I'm sure you felt it, but uh, and we have many examples, I'm going to show you two. Uh, there's only two stories here where the parents actually either completely or, or largely diagnosed that what was wrong with their kids before the docs did. In this case, the mother, who's a terrier, like many parents are, she figured that they probably had a dystonia, of, uh, which was a dopamine deficiency of, of neurotransmitters in the brain, so they couldn't function properly. So they, they supplemented diet with, uh, to, to, to address that. They sort of got a bit better, but not completely better. So then there was sequence. Here's the paper, and I show this to the general public just to show you how boring scientific papers can be. <laughs> <laughs> Whole genome sequencing for optimised patient management. Now, the senior author here, the last author, Richard Gibbs, is actually an Australian. He runs the uh, Genome Centre in the Texas Medical Centre in Houston, which is by far, by a factor of two at least, the biggest medical centre in the world. And it's about the size of Randwick. It's sort of the hundred, there's about seven major hospitals and well over 50 research institutions on the same block of ground. Rich is a country boy from Colac, Victoria, so for the Victorians here, he's one of the, and he got, uh, he's um, made AC a year or so ago, well deservedly. So Rich is one of the pioneers. Now if you read down, I'm not going to, they actually identified that these children were, uh, got double tails in the two up of life, and they both inherited one from mum, one from dad, a damaged gene in this enzyme SPR, encoding this, uh, this enzyme seriaptam reductase. Now, they, there's, a bi there's biochemistry there. So, the, but basically they lack this uh, 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 chemical that was required for synthesizing two neurotransmitters, not just one, dopamine and serotonin. And that's why the kids were disabled, because their brains weren't functioning properly. Very, supplementation of L-DOPA therapy with the hydroxytryptophan, a serotonin precursor, resulted in clinical improvements in both twins. It's pretty bald, really. Let me see, show you what really happened. This was them, then. This is them now, and yeah, and in fact, when I show this, I remember uh, to Alliance uh, clubs, and the Alliance clubs uh, in Australia, and probably we're talking in Chicago next month, probably be the next global project to have to fund the sequencing of all the kids with uh, cancers, and we've they've given us four million dollars already for that. So these two individuals now perfectly normal, graduated high school, running marathons, and this is the family, and I put this up just to show not only how beautiful this family is, uh, but just to have you reflect on the journey they would have taken if this diagnosis hadn't been made. And nobody had a clue what was wrong with them, except mum sort of half figured it out. And you may, you probably do know that uh, families who've got children with disabilities have tremendous stresses. Uh, they cost society, and I don't mean this is a, an unwelcome cost, but a quarter of a million dollars a year on average, mostly in social service support, uh, lost income, etc. And the divorce rates go through the roof, it's in excess of 60%. It's just a wrecking ball through families. So these are wonderful good news stories. Here's another one close to home, uh, Alan's story. This was done by the ABC. In fact, the ABC is doing a half hour show on this, uh, which will go to air sometime uh, in this year, I imagine. And he was a five or six year old boy uh, of uh, Turkish immigrant parents. That's the real picture of Alan, so the cartoon's not a bad thing. And this is Alan. Last year, uh, he was bleeding to death internally and he was chronically in intensive care at the Children's Hospital in Randwick uh, in Sydney. And poor little Mighty, there he is lying in intensive care with his mother. So his mother used to sleep with him and he's got his hand around her head and he's got tubes coming out of him. He's bleeding to death internally, or, um, 
or at risk of death because he has no platelets. So he can't clot his blood. It's the same as when you poison rats. You know? But nobody knew why or, or how to fix it. He just knew that was the problem. So we sequenced him in our facility and we discovered he was missing a gene in the immune system which uh, told us that he had a very strange form of autoimmunity. Chris Goodnow, my deputy, spent the weekend going through the literature and uh, worked out that there uh, was a drug that had been developed for transplantation therapy that was in the same general pathway and it might compensate for this loss in this kid, this boy. So we got emergency ethical approval to put the boy on the drug because there had only been safety tested in, in adults. And I'm not exaggerating, four weeks later he goes home. And this is him now. And he's at school, and uh, he's not completely out of the woods, but uh, he's fine, and he's uh, going to school and having a normal life. A backstory here is his dad, standing behind him with his mum over on the left, um, uh, is a brilliant software engineer, and he's decided to chuck in his uh, conventional job, and he's joined the Garvin Institute to help us do the data analysis in the future, uh, which is just wonderful. So there's, there's, there's you know, um, some synergies around. I'll put this up uh, because this was done at St Vincent's with Tim Furlong. Some of you may know Tim Furlong. He's a renal uh, clinician at St Vincent's in Sydney. And there's been a huge problem in kidney disease because conventional genetic tests can't diagnose this particular condition, which is very uh, common. But because we can do whole genome sequencing, we've been able to overcome that problem. And now we can routinely diagnose this disease, and that's uh, going into the clinic. Um, and uh, we're now starting to use it for cancer risk genetics, and I suck this in to remind me to tell you a story which is not published yet, or partly published, which again demonstrates the value of this information uh, prognostically. Um, David Thomas, who we recruited from Peter Mack in Melbourne, who's fantastic, <coughs> had a thesis which um, was generally accepted, but nobody had the evidence, uh, that uh, cancers that occur in young people are due to inherited mutations. Now, cancer, of course, is a, a disease which, uh, where you lose control of cell growth and development. Cells start to grow and you get a tumour. And the genetic uh, control of our normal development is very, very fine. And there are many proteins involved in that. And when they get damaged and the control is lost, that's the first stage in cancer. So um, it turns out he was able to verify the fact that uh, people with young onset cancer, kids and um, teenagers and young adults, had a fairly high burden of inherited mutations in these genes. So you imagine a simple situation where you've got two genes that are controlling, two copies, one from mum, one from dad, that are controlling cell growth. If one of them's already damaged, you're okay because you've got one good one, but if that gets damaged, you're in big trouble. And the odds of damaging one are much, much higher than damaging both, right? Because you've got to get two hits. So he was able to publish that in Lancet Oncology. Apparently it's changed practice in Germany already. But then what he's done, which is not published, and I want to share this story with you, is to uh, look at several hundred people, uh, their genome sequences, and then identify those who are predicted on the basis of damages to the genes involved in cancer that might be at high risk, and then subjected them to high-resolution MRIs. Now, you've known for a while there are certain genes that give you high risk for certain cancers, like BRCA with breast cancer, you know, the Angelina Jolie story. There's another one for colon cancer, but many of the genes, and this, in this particular case the key one is a thing called P53, cause cancer but you don't know where the cancer is going to pop up. In fact, when we sequenced cancers at the GAV and we did pancreatic and ovarian, we found what everyone else did, and that is that there's no such thing as pancreatic cancer or prostate cancer, there's just cancer. They, they pop up in different places, but the mutations that cause the disease are actually relatively common. The spectrum is a bit different in different tissues, but so we can cross-purpose. You know, for example, 15% of breast cancers are caused by a mutation in a gene called HER2. 8% of colon cancers are caused by that same mutation. 3% of pancreatic cancers. So we can now use the drug, Herceptin, which was developed to treat breast cancer, to treat that subset of colon and pancreatic cancers. But we have to sequence the cancer to know that that's the drug we should use. So what David's done uh, is take the high-risk individuals predicted from genome sequence and then subject them to whole-body MRI because he doesn't know where the cancer might might be. 14% of the people, one in seven, had a cancer they didn't know about that was detected by MRI. 
Now, this was months or maybe years in advance of symptoms. At that point, easy to nip out, you know, and resect it. So this is going to change treatment. You imagine a situation when your genome sequence and mine is automatically in the, in the database. Your physician, your health manager, will say, John, you look all right for a bloke your age, but you're actually at high risk for cancer. Uh, I know you're going to worry, but don't. You're going to, this is going to be to your benefit because we want you to make sure you get a you know, whole body MRI every 12 months or whatever because nipped in the bud is the way we'll fix it. And instead of being brought in late uh, with a semi-metastatic tumour because that's when the, the symptoms uh, appear, uh, we'll get it early and you should be fine. In fact, we're, uh, next week I'll be talking to AMP about doing the actuarial calculations on life insurance and employment insurance because I think, I'm sh pretty sure I'm right, that this actually, instead of people being penalised for having uh, genetic this sort of cancer predisposition, they can be rewarded because the life insurance companies are much less likely to have to pay out massive amounts of money if it's fixed picked up early. Nobody wants to die and the insurance companies don't want to have to pay. So they're actually talking, informally at least, about dropping premiums for people who have genome sequencing. Or, now here's another one, 5% of people uh, of Northwestern European ancestry have uh, mutations which make them at elevated risk for blood clotting, DVT and stroke. Don't worry. Just take an aspirin a day and you'll be fine. Back in the normal range. So, so this is this is the transformation because we'll use an assessment of our, where our risks and idiosyncrasies are to head off problems. Forewarned is forearmed in almost every case. So let me just quickly take you through. Oh, this is a, just throw this in. We spend a lot of money in software. Um, as I said, we're not this one, but another software we're about to license to the, one of the biggest HMOs in the United States. It's being trialled by the NHS in England and uh, also in Japan. And um, just to give you a sense of how global this enterprise is and where we sit in this, at, uh, in the St Vincent's family, uh, some months ago I had a visit from Sir Malcolm Grant, whom some of you may know is the chair of uh, NHS in England. And he oversees a budget of £100 billion a year. And he came to see us because he was, he's heard so much about what we were doing. So we really are among the global leadership in this. And this is an automatic software that will take whole genome sequence to a diagnosis of um, monogenic type disease, protein coding damaging mutations in five minutes. So this takes all the back end away from the necessary from clinicians and they can use their domain knowledge to then filter the, what comes out of this and then work with the person or the family in front of them. So initial applications are clinical. We've done genetic diagnosis, but I think the 10% figure is worth just reflecting. About 8 to 10%, depending on how you cut it, of all of us will suffer a hospitalisation event at some point in our lives because of a simple genetic problem, whether it's blood clotting or whatever. Uh, I've done uh, cancer risk and cancer diagnosis. Um, uh, can't dwell on it, but uh, people at Peter Mac in Melbourne now develop blood tests that allow uh, monitoring of cancer from blood tests rather than invasively and uh, to monitor the changes. And actually there's good evidence that we may be able to again, predict cancer in advance from those tests. And the combination of that and the genome and medical MRIs, et cetera, will, will change the dynamic. Instead of getting hit whacked late, uh, we get early warning, and uh, then the mo monitoring pr um, procedures will, will adapt to that and, for most of us, uh, avoid the bad consequences of getting cancer. Drug reactions, just quickly, uh, you probably know this, uh, but I was surprised. 7.6% of all hospital admissions in Australia are due to adverse reactions to prescription drugs. Not methamphetamines, prescription drugs. And the reason is because we all have different rates of clearing of foreign compounds. Think coffee. Some of us can have a coffee and go straight to bed, others are wired for 24 hours. And the reason for that is that we have different variants of enzymes in our liver that clear these compounds. And if you clear them quickly, they go. And uh, if you clear them slowly, they build up toxic levels. And clopidogel, which is used as an anticoagulant uh, in surgery, 40% of people clear that so quickly you might as well not bother giving it to them and use some other drug. 40% re respond normally. 20% clear it so slowly they're back in a hospital with a, uh, and admitted to ED. I'm told informally that metropolitan hospitals will keep country patients for a day longer than they do metropolitan patients because 
it's easy enough to get somebody back from, you know, uh, Kew or Strathfield, uh, but from, you know, Blaney or Whoop Whoop is a different matter. So this is a really big problem. We can avoid, we can predict and avoid about half of these straight up. We could save 2 to 4% of all hospital emissions in this country by putting the infrastructure in place. Um, research, a lot of research. Um, I, I, I won't uh, belabor this, but I do want to give you some flavours. Exceptional responders are the most exciting things of all, I think. Every, every branch of medicine has exceptional responders. I want to, uh, that's the way the AIDS drugs were developed. You know, there were p people who had a high burden of HIV virus but were not immunocompromised. Turns out they lacked a receptor in their immune system that was required for the virus to get in and destroy the immune system. So that's the way those drugs were realising that. But the one I want to tell you about is a woman in Melbourne we sequenced recently who was treated for metastatic melanoma, stage four metastatic melanoma, 15 years ago in Melbourne. And, you know, stage four metastatic melanoma, if you've got bone metastases, you, you're going to die. So apparently she had a large tumour in her brain, which I think was causing a lot of pain or was going to get her early, so they, they treated it with radiation. And after that treatment, all of the tumours disappeared and never came back. All through her body, they just treated the one in the brain. And uh, the clue was that she got an autoimmune disease at the same time called Crohn's disease, but having that problem is better than being dead, I suppose. But the question was why? Anyway, we sequenced her. She's, uh, she's got a mutation in one of the most famous genes in the immune system. It's a cell surface receptor. It's a totally different pathway from any of the treatments that are out there. And uh, it's a very straightforward matter to, to develop a drug or an antibody therapy to block that in normal people. So we're really hopeful that we'll have a new treatment for cancer. So this is where the research using this genomics can actually inform new therapies, new understanding. Uh, we're studying people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, just very quickly, you, know, you may know that 25% of people who suffer type 1 diabetes crash later in life with vascular problems, etc. And the other 75% are fine. We know why now. We haven't published it yet, but we've got to check it. But uh, we think we know why by sequencing those that do and don't crash. Uh, because when you get a sort of bimodal response like this, it's almost certainly, not, not necessarily, but probably genetic, that there's another factor in the background that's uh, um, influencing the outcomes. And we're starting to sequence, you know, people with osteoporosis, epilepsy, schizophrenia, etc. many of those with uh, colleagues around the country and around the world. The end game here is personal and systemic health management. Uh, most of the people in the system are still focused on diagnosis, but and the early wins are there, as I've shown you with those kids. But that's only a, a way station to the real end game, which is health management. So there will be, and if the federal government supports this, it will, will, go, will go down this journey, there'll be one universal genetic test, a whole genome sequence of the entire consented population. Uh, and then that'll go into, and, and uh, my view is it should be uh, run by the federal government, uh, uh, for the public good, because uh, these uh, medical records, uh, sorry, these genomes have to be integrated with medical records. We've got a proverbial dog's breakfast of systems at the moment, but we're working on how to integrate that. Uh, and I'd also, if the federal government funds this, it will encourage, if not force, the states to put their medical records into one national database so that everybody can benefit from the analysis of that information. And that data ecology, I call it, and we're talking to CSRO Data 61 with startup companies about using blockchain technologies and other things to protect personal privacy and also personal provenance over the information so that people have absolute security over its privacy but also absolute control over how it's used to research or anywhere else. Um, and that'll be interrogated continuously as new information comes to hand from research, etc., and will then be disseminated out to the immune system uh, sorry, into the medical system to um, uh, inform medical care and also uh, management of the health system. So basically, <coughs> it's whole of life health management we're facing. This will change the relationship of everybody in the community with the healthcare system. Uh, and the healthcare system will, will, will graduate from being a cottage industry to, or a series of cottage industries to actually something that's run at national scale for, for the benefit of all our citizens. We started a, a, one of the world's first genomic uh, analysis companies, which is clinically accredited. And, and we're starting a new ecology, this is the second last slide, where people don't just uh, have clinical records, you know, randomly associated with them, but their sequences 
go into a central database called Jim's type phenotype big words database, which goes straight in diagnosis and prognosis as the you interrogate the information, but also generates new information and contributes to population health management. These are the people who've done the work, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you.